friends in today's presentation i will be talking about the biomechanics of hip joint and the principles which are relevant to hip arthroplasty so why are we concerned about the biomechanics because every procedure that is going to be performed on hip joint is going to affect the biomechanics biomechanics meaning it is the study of the motion function and structure of the moving parts of the living organisms so if we are studying the biomechanics of hip joint that means we are studying the forces structure and the motion around the hip joint so it is important to understand the common pathologies of hip joint and any reconstructive procedure that is performed around hip joint needs to restore the biomechanics of hip joint at least approximately so that the function is restored in an appropriate manner and any errors in the positioning of arthroplasty components can jeopardize the clinical outcomes therefore a lot of research is going on concerning the biomechanics of hip joint you can find new papers every then and now that are getting published related to biomechanics of hip joint so that's why it's important to be at least aware about the basic biomechanics of hip joint so the objectives of this presentation is to make you aware of the normal biomechanics of hip joint and the influence of total hip arthroplasty on these biomechanics and ways to recreate the approximate biomechanics of the hip joint during reconstructive procedures. So before going into details, we need to be aware of the basic definitions related to biomechanics. So first is joint reaction force. The joint reaction force is the force that is generated within a joint. That means it is a sum of all forces that are acting at a particular time inside the joint so if you see there are forces acting on the hip joint from all the directions example if the patient is abducting the hip joint and adducting the hip joint that means there is force of adductor muscles abductor muscles along with the body weight so the body weight along with the other muscular forces that are acting inside the joint in this area will result in joint reaction force that is sum of all forces acting at a particular time second the coupled forces coupled forces are two parallel forces which are usually equal in magnitude but opposite in direction usually there is a fulcrum in between and if you see if the force is acting here then automatically an equal force will be applied on this direction also therefore they are usually balanced now coming to the figure you see if the abductor pull is there the abductor muscles are pulling the pelvis in this direction then automatically it is going to lift the body weight in the proximal direction so here the abductor pull and the force which is acting on the opposite side of the pelvis will be the coupled force and the fulcrum here will be the hip joint then joint congruence the joint congruence relates to the fit of two articular surfaces and if they are perfectly matching each other that means they are congruent now if you see on the right side right hip joint the head of the femur it perfectly parallel to the articular surface of the acetabulum this is the weight bearing part of the acetabulum or you can say sorcel but on the opposite side you see the weight bearing part of the acetabulum is fine but the head part of the femur is not parallel to this articular surface or you can say it is not perfectly round that means the joint congruence is lost so this is a sign of joint congruence that means perfectly matching surfaces and this is a sign of non congruent joint that means the articular surface are not matching here also you see the congruence is not there because the femoral head does not perfectly correspond to the articular surface of the SW that means the joint congruence is lost then coming to the instant center of rotation the instant center of rotation is nothing but the center of rotation of a joint at one particular time for example if you see the knee joint is not a perfectly round hinge joint it is actually anteroposteriorly elongated so in sagittal plane the distal femur is actually ellipsoid. The proximal tibia articulates with this part and whenever the flexion occurs, the center of rotation changes to posterior. It means starts from here and follows this curved shape. That means the center of rotation changes every time. Therefore, the instant center of rotation of knee joint is different according to the flexion we are performing. On the contrary, we assume that the hip joint is perfectly spherical that's why the center of rotation is assumed to be at one particular point only therefore the instant center of rotation of hip joint is at one particular point then coming to the center of gravity if we see in the sagittal plane the center of gravity of human body is just anterior to the s2 here and the weight bearing line passes from the mastoid process to just anterior to the ankle joint in sagittal plane the hip joint is actually anterior to the weight bearing axis in sagittal plane 
while the shoulder joint is slightly posterior to the weight bearing axis in serrator plane. The weight bearing axis passes centrally through the knee joint in the serrator plane. In corner plane, the weight bearing axis passes exactly in the midline. The weight bearing force that was just anterior to the S2 in this region is actually distributed to the hip joint bilaterally. So if the patient is standing on both feet, that will transmit the force to the hip joint at an angle of 16 degree to the vertical line as shown here but you see but you see the anatomical axis of the femur is actually 9 degree angulated to the vertical line whenever we are standing so therefore the angle is now 25 degree when the reference line is parallel to the femur shaft therefore the angle now becomes 25 degree so we can say that the weight bearing axis when transmitted to the hip joint is at 25 degree angulation in relation to the femur axis so this angle is going to be 25 degree and this forms the basis of the reconstructive procedure that are performed around the hip joint for example if there is neck femur fracture non-union of neck femur fracture and we are planning for valgus osteotomy for that if the forces has to go perfectly perpendicular to the fracture so the fracture alignment should be like this if we want the compressive forces directly perpendicular to the flexure. Therefore, in valgus osteotomy, we target that the angle should be 25 degree in relation to the femoral shaft axis. And if we take the horizontal line, the angle would be 16 degree. Just revise these angles. 9 degree is the inclination of the femoral axis to the vertical line. 16 degree is the angle of the weight bearing line, weight bearing line at the hip joint in relation to the vertical line this yellow line and 25 degree is the angulation of the weight bearing axis at hip joint in relation to the femoral shaft axis and for reconstructive procedures like valgus osteotomy for neck femur non-union we target that the angle of fracture should be 25 degree to the horizontal now the ball and socket orientation of the hip joint we assume that the hip joint is spherical but actually it is slightly ellipsoid slightly ellipsoid the horseshoe orientation of the estabular cartilage helps in uniform distribution of the stress on the femoral head so this is actually the weight bearing part this is the bare area or you can say which is used for analyzing the depth of true estabulum whenever we are reaming the estabulum for cup placement now coming to the muscular forces so under normal conditions the muscle forces are well balanced by each other if we have to perform one particular motion then the muscles which perform those motion have to be at higher force compared to the balancing muscles then automatically that movement will be performed for example, if we are performing abduction at the hip joint, that will result in higher force of the abductor muscles compared to the adductor. And if we are standing without doing anything, that means the forces will be balanced. So in equilibrium, the forces of flexor muscles will be equal to extensor forces and abduction force will be equal to adduction force and internal rotation force will be equal to the external rotation force. Now coming to the example of forces equilibrium and their distribution. So this is our normal scenario in which the abductor muscles force is higher than the adductor muscles force whenever we are lifting the opposite side hemi pelvis in single limb stance that means this limb is lifted and the weight bearing is on is performed on this limb that will result in high abduction force but if the abductor muscles are weak that will result in tilting of the pelvis downwards on the contralateral side and the patient will not be able to balance the hip joint and in a compensatory mechanism what he will do he'll try to shift the center of the body weight which was earlier here towards this side so that the force which is being applied is lower will be coming to that in the fractures also this thing can happen and non unions any pathology around hip joint can result in reduced abduction pull which can result in positive Trendelenburg test so this is the principle of Trendelenburg test in which the patient is not able to lift the opposite side hemi pelvis when standing on the affected side so the patient automatically gets compensation by tilting the body weight towards the affected side now coming to its principle so if you see the abductor force has to act on this side and the body weight has to act on this side you see the lever arm on the abductor side is small while on the opposite side it is large so therefore high amount of force has to be applied on this side to lift the body weight on this side therefore this force which is being applied here has to be strong one but suppose if there is weakness here and the body weight is lying here then the patient will have difficulty in lifting this weight so what he'll do he'll try to tilt whole of his body towards this side 
and what will happen then the lever arm on this side will become short and the lever arm on this side will become longer so longer lever arm will require a less amount of force compared to a shorter lever arm so if the patient is shifting the body weight towards this side the lever arm will get shortened and the amount of force which is required on this side on this side to lift this part up will be smaller therefore the patient tends to tilt the body weight towards the affected side <clears throat> this whole assembly is the abductor mechanism so the part of the abductor mechanism is the femoral head the acetabulum or you can say hip joint the abductor muscles and whole of this whole of this bone stock and the body weight which is acting on the opposite side so any failure on this component can result in abductor mechanism failure so there can be fracture of the proximal femur that can result in failure of the fulcrum then there can be muscle imbalance which can result in poor muscle pull on this side then there can be arthritis which can result in reduced motion around this area or you can say it is it will be painful therefore the muscles will not be able to act properly or whenever there is deformity automatically when deformity is there then also the motion will get hindered and any hip pathology that is hindering the normal motion of hip joint can result in abductor mechanism failure the shanton line is actually representing the bony component of the abductor mechanism so any fracture or dislocation in this area will result in disruption of the shanton line and automatically whenever the abductor mechanism is affected there will be positive Prandtl-Berg test that means the opposite side hemipelvis will drop downwards when in single limb stance phase or you can say the patient will tilt the body towards the affected side. Now coming to the lower limb alignment overall. Now I've told you earlier that the femoral anatomical axis is 9 degree tilted compared to the vertical line. Now you see the vertical line is here and the angle of the anatomical axis of femur is actually 9 degree. And the center of the hip joint center of the knee joint and center of ankle joint will join to form the mechanical axis. The difference between the me mechanical axis and the anatomical axis of femur is 6 degree while in tibia it is same. For any procedure that is performed on the lower limb, we have to keep in mind that we have to restore the mechanical axis. That means the center of hip, knee and ankle should pass in the straight line. So why it is important to restore the mechanical axis? Because you see if you are keeping all the joints in single line, whenever you are standing you are actually creating a very well balanced knee alignment just see the example if the stones are stacked together perfectly centered to each other then automatically it is it will be remain balanced but if we stack the stones like this irregularly that will result in failure of their assembly similarly if you see if the patient is keeping the limb in this position that means hip flex knee flex and then attempting to stand then to compensate for the gravity the anterior muscle of the knee joint that is called quadriceps muscle has to maintain a force to prevent any falling down and similarly the hip extensor muscles also have to maintain a force to prevent any further flexion of the hip joint so that will be an energy consuming procedure on the contrary if the patient is standing no extra force is required except for the equilibrium force that is maintaining the balance between the group of muscles no extra force is required now coming to the normal hip movements so the movements at hip joint include flexion extension abduction adduction and external rotation versus internal rotation the flexion is around 100 degree with knee extended and 140 degree when knee is flexed why because the hamstring muscles need to be relaxed for further flexion and the extension of hip joint is around 15 to 20 degree the abduction is around 10 to 45 degree while the adduction is around 10 to 30 degree the external rotation is around 60 degree while internal rotation is around 30 degree the rotations are variable in flexion and extension because in extension the hip joint capsule is taut therefore the rotational movements are limited while during flexion the capsule gets relaxed therefore the rotation movement can increase however this is subject to inter-individual variation so this is a picture of hip joint capsule you see whenever the limb is extended these fibers they are taut they are in a spiral as well as longitudinal pattern you can see these fibers are spiral in orientation while these are longitudinal so in extension they are taut they do not allow extra rotational movement while when flexion is performed they all become relaxed and they allow further rotational movements so we need to be aware of the normal hip movements during our day-to-day -day life because then only we will be able to restore the normal motion of hip joint during any reconstructive procedure so when you are bending down to tie your shoelace the flexion at hip joint is around 125 degree while there's 20 degree of external rotation and 15 degree of abduction 
as you can see here while in stair climbing as you can see here the flexion is around 70 degree in stair descent there is flexion of around 35 degree so as far as the gait part is concerned during the legs swing phase when the heel is going to touch the ground there is need of around 35 to 45 degree of flexion to keep the limb forward so that the heel is going to touch the ground while in heel of phase that means here to lift the body of the ground to generate a push off there is a need of extension of around 15 to 20 degrees so therefore in this phase there will be need for extension of the hip joint while a variable amount of pelvis motion will be occurring in all these movements it may occur at the hip joint it may occur at the si joint and it may occur at the lumbo pelvic junction also